Before we get started, a message from our friends at Keeley Companies. Keeley Companies wholeheartedly believes that if you get the right people, the results will follow. They set themselves apart with a forward-thinking culture that empowers their people and fosters loyal partnerships. They are also proud sponsors, partners, and super fans of this podcast. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Got a question for you to kick off the show today. Have you ever had that nagging belief somewhere in the back of your mind that you just don't belong, that you're not enough, that that if people figured out who you really were, where you came from, what you're thinking about, how broken you actually are, that they would go and turn and run in the exact opposite direction? Well, our guest today can most certainly relate with you on that. Although she is the graduate of Yale Law School, it's one of the most prestigious law schools in the world, that's not where her story began. Although she is a successful entrepreneur and a best-selling author, actually, that's not where the story begins. Her story begins in a very small, impoverished community with a very difficult family situation and the feeling, at least, the feeling as if she never quite fit in. This is the story about coming home, my friends. This is the story about becoming comfortable in your own skin. This is the story ultimately about recognizing that you are enough, that your past has poured the foundation perfectly to where you are today. And the truth remains, if you choose, the truth remains that your best days are in front of you. You're going to love this conversation with my friend. Her name is Mary Morant. So grab your journals, grab your pens, grab grab a little something to drink, get comfortable, buckle up. We're going to talk today about dirt about rising up and about becoming the best versions of ourselves with my friend and now yours. Her name is Mary Morantz. Mary, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Oh, John, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this so much from the second I knew it was going to happen. And I was just telling you before we hopped on, I've watched your video twice, not once, but twice. Um, And I was just telling my husband, Justin, like, I just feel like this is going to be the most beautiful conversation because... I feel like they're they're in in different ways. There's a lot of overlap between our stories, so I'm excited. Even the way you describe your story in the book, Dirt, the, the, you, you write about scars, yeah. you write about dirt, and you write about coming home to the thing you ran away from, and yeah. you even write about a red cape. And so many of the stories and the terms that you are using are also stories and terms that I use. Oh, and so wow. when, I, when I read it, when I've learned about your journey, when I've uh, fallen in love with where you've been and what you're doing today. Mary, it's just it's cool to have you on, and I think our listeners are going to love your life story, which is not only like oh, it's about Mary; it's really about us. Yeah, but coming home to um, to the stuff that actually matters. So, Mary, for those who may not know your story yet, they may not know everything that you're doing today. Yeah. Give us a snapshot of what your uh, what your life looks like right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important to kind of understand a little bit of the the backstory really quickly, because even even in the book, it's kind of divided into these two parts because it's almost like I'm living or for a while, it felt like I was living two different lives. So there's the girl in the trailer and the girl after the trailer. And, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s in a single wide trailer on the very top of a mountain in rural West Virginia. Um, the, the trailer itself was very leaky. We had one point like built on this little like lean to shack to the side, which was like the addition. That's like what you did to, you know, step up the trailer, I guess. And it was also very leaky. And, you know, my dad's a logger. My grandfather's a coal miner. Um, we, we just had this very, like looking back on it now, this, it it felt really normal at the time, but kind of an unusual childhood, I guess. There was definitely like the normal eighties childhood of like, you leave it dawn and you come back like sometime after dark and like as long as you don't get into too much trouble your kids or your parents sort of let you go the, um, the younger listeners have no idea what you're talking no about no idea time where kids could do what they wanted all day long <laughs> all day long time. like i mean when i think back on it now i really don't know how we didn't die like a thousand different ways <laughs> rattlesnakes and bees nests and all this other stuff but you but know so, since you're, you're beginning at the beginning let's yeah. just let's just slowly step through this because i 
I find that your past is what makes your present oh, yeah. worthy of being celebrated. I mean, it's really what makes where you are today so remarkable. And so you're talking about this single wide trailer. Mm. Give those who have never been in a, in a trailer even greater definition of what you're referring to. What, what is a single wide trailer and a leaky roof and yeah. a mossy floor and everything else? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like living in a giant tin can. You know, it is very aluminum. And, and, and what I mean by that is like you... Um, you experience it that way in all five senses. So you hear the raindrops on the aluminum and you, um, you feel the, the leaks coming through. You feel that floor beneath you giving way because it's just like a sieve, you know, the rain's coming right through the roof and right through the floor and keep, it keeps on going. We at different points had mushrooms growing out of the carpet. The, the, the boards beneath actually gave way. So you had to learn how to hopscotch in just the right places to hit the carpet so you didn't fall through. Um, you know, we had a lot of stray animals we were constantly taking in and they were you know they were inside the trailers they would go into the bathroom inside the trailer so I mean it was uh it was not the like you know there's some trailers I think sometimes when people think of trailers they think of like the double wide and maybe it's got like a brick foundation put around it this was sort of the like roughest I guess of the single wide trailers as you can imagine and so it's one long um, aluminum tin can. So my bedroom was one on it on one end, my parents on the other, a kitchen, a living room, um, in between. And it's just, you know, it's, it's what, you know, as you're growing up. And so it's only kind of like, I mean, I sort of had a sense at the time I was like, well, I think I, I, I would like a real house, but yeah. looking back, you don't realize just how unusual it was. Um, did you have neighbors around you? You know, we did. And I would say within the, like, five or ten house radius we were probably the only like the true single wide there were some double wides and there were some like my grandma goldie had a house but even like the house is just sort of like a a very very simple house you know it's not like what we would probably think of as a house now um but then there were some that were just like brick houses and nicer houses so it kind of ran the spectrum and that was actually very important to me in dirt to include because you know a lot of times people especially people in Appalachia they get frustrated because it's like Please stop representing us as in a single wide trailer with a truck on blocks with stray dogs with a parent who's a logger or a coal miner and your Scotch Irish descent. And it's like, I get it, but that's also my story. Like I check all of these boxes. So it was important to me to include other characters. Like I have like the, the Baptist family, um, that became kind of a second family to me who lived no more than five miles away and lived in a totally different world, a really nice two story house, et cetera. So it was, I mean, in some ways it's like the common experience of West Virginia, but there's also no such thing. I think that's what we're learning is there's no such thing as the common experience of an area. The, the, the characters from your book just come alive. And, and one of them is a woman named Goldie. Yeah. Talk about Goldie. Uh, I say in the book, one part firecracker, one part sassafras. She was <laughs> five foot two. She had this like dandelion puff of gray hair and she was up just a powerhouse. She was a, she was very, very, very much a firecracker, uh, a spitfire as it were. And so she, you know, her favorite sayings were, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And in case you missed it, I'm the dang Roman. (laughs) So she definitely had opinions and she was, she was funny because she would go to church in her like proper pink suit, lace ruffle collar, you know, with her white lady shoulders perfume. And then she'd come home and put on like t-shirts and jeans and she could slam a door like nobody's business. I would say, um, and there's this great story early on in the book I share of her. She's just, I just see so much of her in me now, this like stubborn determination. She decided that this like busted up cinder block garage that stood between her house and our trailer. Cause we were, our trailer was put on her land. Um, she said, I'll take it down brick by brick, you know, block by block if I have to. And she tied a chain into the second floor window frame, intending to just take out that piece that day. And the whole thing came down. And I'm telling you the whole mountain shook when it happened. I was standing in the yard, like, what did you do? And I watched her cinder block by cinder block, haul that thing off to the dump. And by the end of summer, it took a while. It took a lot of grit. It took a lot of stubbornness. Um, but she did what she said she was going to do. And I think that was the first time I kind of got this message of like, the world is not going to hand it to you. You know, if you want to make something happen to a certain extent, brick by brick, you'll have to tear it down or build it up yourself. Yeah. You write extensively about your father. And so I want to yeah. talk about that in a moment, uh, a bit less about your mom. Yeah. I thought we'd begin with your mom, actually. Talk about your mom. Yeah. So, um, you know, a huge, a huge journey in writing this book was, was my relationship with my mom and um, probably like the central point of, 
of healing, I would say. I mean, certainly not the only one, but um, I had two drafts of this book. I mean, there were many, many, many drafts of this book, but two main drafts of this book. And draft one to draft two could not have been more different. And it kind of represents what happened in my heart in writing this book. Draft one of my heart to like the final draft of my heart on the other side, this place of just like, I just sort of picture like a knot coming loose to healing. And so the short version is that, um, you know, my mom, my mom did not have it easy growing up. You know, I, like I sort of talk about all the characters, nobody necessarily had it super easy in that area. And, um, she was just, she like me, and this is one of the biggest things I think to come out of this book is when you can start to recognize the beliefs and the drives in, in you that you understand that person who maybe hurt you also had those drives and beliefs. And so she was determined to go build a good life. And ironically, the thing that made her, she left when I was nine to go work on the road for a job to, that hopefully could make more money, but also I think to just go like chase her dreams and a life for herself. But the thing that made her leave getting away from that trailer is also the thing that made me leave. And I had to kind of come to grips with that. I'm not saying it's the same thing. You know, she had me to, to consider in the mix, but I think there just came this place of, I know what it is to be driven by that desire to go build a better life than you grew up with. And I think that's what she was doing. And so the first draft of that book was a lot like, look what I did despite this. And it was angry and it was not in this place of healing. And this, this final draft operates out of a place of empathy and reconciliation. And we actually did a three hour call, my mom and I, and I would say that everybody listening, one of the biggest things I could tell you that could come out of this that was very unexpected for me writing this book is you will be amazed how much healing can happen in just one three-hour call. There can be a lifetime of hurt, a lifetime of estrangement, and one three-hour call can really start, I'm not saying it fixes everything, but it can really start to unravel that. And so it was really interesting to figure out how to handle both being true and not glossing over what it did to me for her to leave but also saying there's hope there's, there's the poss grace can heal wounds you would never believe. And there is the possibility of reconciliation. So Mary, there are what I know to be true. Many of our listeners are struggling with this lack of reconciliation in their lives with mm -hmm. a loved one, yeah. whether it's a former spouse, a child, sadly for so many of us, just no relationship with a child, with a parent. Mm -hmm. Many of us have no relationship with a parent, a guardian, a sibling, for what I understand, almost half of us have mm. lost relationship with siblings, wow. or, or just simply a dear friend that we've lost, uh, we've lost connection with. Yeah. For those of us who are feeling that right now, what, what advice might you give them mm. uh, yeah. as they struggle with this this in between period? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that helped me begin to consider um, what it would look like to have true reconciliation was um, I one of the very first shows that I did on my podcast, it was a solo episode. I talked about, um, forgiving when an apologies never come or something like that. And I was reading the book boundaries with Dr. Henry cloud and Dr. Townsend, and they were talking about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And they said, forgiveness is an internal one man, one woman job where you determine to do that work in your heart and you do it because it frees you up. You know, it's like you decide to stop drinking poison, hoping it'll hurt the other person. You do it for your heart to untangle. And then it said, you know, reconciliation is a two-person job. Like that other person has to be involved. They have to come to the table. They have to not only be sorry, but they have to be willing to turn away from whatever that behavior was. And so I feel like step one is forgiveness and doing that for like the peace it brings you. And then when you're operating out of that peace and you're operating out of being freed up, you, like you will be amazed how heavy that weight was once you stop carrying it. When you're freed up from that and you have a little more, you know, margin and energy to think about having grace for other people, um, then you can start the conversation about reconciliation. And I would say that that literally is a conversation. Like maybe you'll do that call and they won't be in a place where they're changing behavior. And I think it's okay to say, I'm going to protect my family, myself, my world that I'm building from toxic from toxic people. So if that, I'm not saying like you have to let everybody back into your life, but if they are at a place where they say, you know, my mom said on that phone call, I thought I was leaving to help my family and I ended up losing my family in the process. And, um, leaving you is one of the greatest regrets and mistakes in my life. And then she like broke down in tears. And the thing I actually said, and I write it in the book, but I actually said it in the call at the time was, well, there's still time, you know, you're still here. I'm still here. 
there's still time. We're still family. So forgiveness is the first step. Do that for yourself and then begin to tiptoe and step into reconciliation. So we, we've had the opportunity of interviewing Steve Jobs, wife, Lisa, Steve Jobs, daughter, Lisa. And mm. one of the most tragic events in, <laughs> that I've ever really heard is the, the conversation between a dying father and his daughter. Mm. And it's saying, you know what, next time, ne next time I'm going to make this all better. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure about the next time, mm. but let's try to get it right this time. And I think that's something you were sharing with your mom, but there's still yeah. time. We, yeah. We can through this and you had one example of what parenting looked like from your mother you had a very different example of what parenting and leadership love grit dirt mm. looked like from another one of your parents yeah Guy, you named dad yeah your dad just seems like a really remarkable character yeah. in a book and he happens to be an actual real person in your life so yeah. Brad, talk, share a little bit about your father yeah i mean i think what's kind of cool is that my dad started out and and you see this in the book he started out as like not really being sure about wanting to be a father um, certainly not wanting to be a father at 23. Um, they got married when my mom was 17 and he was like 20, just shy of 21. So a couple years later, she was like, you know, let's, let's have a baby. And, um, I think he was sort of, you know, well, we did the like get married thing young. Let's like be young for a little longer. And he just didn't really understand babies. They cry, they want things, you know, they're, they're not very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, they're very needy. And he just was not really that interested. And then there's this great moment where they're in the hospital and he hears all the babies crying and he's like, see there, exactly, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. And supposedly, according to the truth, according to grandma Goldie, when they rounded the corner, I was the only baby not crying. And it was like an instant shift. Um, I talk about in the book for between that kid, oh, that kid crying in there to the kid. And so there's this whole running, um, I don't even know what you call it, like just theme or it's reality. It was my life where he did not call me by my given name, even though he's the one who named me until I went to law school. And so from like at least zero to 18 until I left for college, I was the kid. Um, uh, Hey kid, we know what's doing. And so, um, we were just this interesting pair where he wasn't, he didn't really want to be a dad, didn't really know how to be a dad. And then when my mom did leave, we had to figure out how to do life together. And we end up becoming this kind of like, um, I say we're like these two complex molecules bound together. Um, we, we, you know, we are the same kind of stubborn, this, all the similarities in us that drove us to our differences. And so, you know, there's this ongoing theme between me as like the little kid who sees him as like Paul Bunyan to me, the adult who has to see him like me drifting away from him as I become an adult and me as an adult who comes back to him, mm. um, in this place of empathy of like, man, it is hard to be an adult. It's so hard. It's so hard um, to hold it all together and especially to hold it all together in those circumstances. So we just, yeah, it's like this really powerful story of like, he was determined that I would get out. I would get out of that trailer. I would get out of the town. But to him, getting out was to go to like, you know, WVU was to go to the big state university, which I did for my undergrad. And then it was like, he set this freight train in motion and was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The second it was like, now I'm going to go outside the state. I'm going to go to England for a year and then Connecticut for, you know, to come to law school. Um, and so there is this tension as a parent, I think, between like setting your kids free, but then really having to own what that looks like um, that he definitely had a hard time with. You, your father started work at age 12. And I don't mm. mean he was working at the country club at age 12. Right, right. You know, he was carrying golf bags for, for his client, his father's clients at age. No, not at all. Th yeah. This man becomes a logger. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've been in West Virginia a dozen times or more. Oh, and it's no one of the greatest states in our country. Just a stunning, stunning state. And everybody knows about coal. Yeah. I'd never once thought about logging. Oh, as yeah. Being one of the big industries within your state. And your father, it's a family tradition, goes into logging. Talk about what, yeah. what logging looks like. Because this is uh, this is now part of your father's DNA. What does logging look like? What's his yeah. job? In yeah, I mean, what's so interesting is that our family, like you said, our family tree goes back eight generations of loggers. And if you look at the West Virginia state flag, um, there's a picture uh, in the seal of a man holding an axe and a man holding a pickaxe. And they're both leaning against this rock that says like June 20th, um, 1863, when West Virginia became a state. And if you actually read about it, I think the axe was supposed to represent agriculture. Um, and like, there's like corn behind him, but that's, I, I don't, I don't feel like, ag, like corn or 
or what have you is a big part of the industry. I think it's logging and coal mining. And so, you know, eight generations back in logging, we did have a couple generations, my grandfather, my great grandfather who did both, they would work two jobs, one, you know, in the morning logging and then go into a coal mining shift in the evening. Um, you know, I would say like they would work two jobs in the time it took most people to think about doing one, like hard work, work ethic is not an inheritance we had to worry about in our family. Um, but my dad started at 12 with his dad and his grandfather and his first job in the woods. This is insane to me. I, I ask him about this all the time. Like, are you sure? Are you sure I have this right? He would take these, it's called a, a tree grab. It's like two hooks on a scissor hinge, like giant rusty, um, mm -hmm. scissor hinge with hooks. And he would put them in the tree in the log that had just been cut so they could use chains to tie it to the horses that would pull the log down to the landing. And I'm like horses, like it's like 18... 42 yeah, right, or, you know, right. um, but like logging in, in the way that my family does it and the way that my dad does it, it has not changed that much. Now, I think most people outside of logging, I was actually kind of nervous to talk about logging in the book because I was like, I don't know how people are going to respond to an industry that can seem like, um, it's wreaking havoc on the, on the environment. And there are, there are versions of that that do, but the way that my family does it, I always say like one man, one saw, one tree at a time. And my dad is like this guy who believes that if you cut down this hundred year old giant only to bust it up into a bunch of splinters, you have committed the ultimate failure in your craft. And so he teaches anybody who comes to work for him, it took a hundred years to get there. It's worth five minutes more of your time to do it right. So he is just kind of like this living legend, Paul Bunyan. Like they, they just, I feel like they don't make him like, you know, make it like him anymore. Um, but he is definitely reaching that part of his life where he feels like, that's fading away. You know, it'll sort of end with him. Um, and he's kind of making peace with that because I am not taking on the family tradition, you know? So no, it yeah. does look like you're, you're, you're physically made for that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do I have, I have cut down a tree with a chainsaw though, and I have run a dozer. So I'm just saying, <laughs> uh, you have a picture of your, your father and it's his hands and it's a picture of mm. them black and white. Why do you keep that picture? Mm. Oh man. Um, well, Justin and I had a business for 14, 15 years before I signed a contract to start writing books. Um, and we were especially known for our black and white photography. And I used to teach him workshops. Um, it's a variation on a quote that I found that said, if you want to know what someone wore, show it in color. If you want to know what something felt like, show it in black and white. And you know, obviously there's a place for both. We love both color and black and white photography, but there is something that happens when you remove the distraction of color where you can start to see the texture and you can start to see the like highlights and shadows of how it breaks across your subject and really shows off a much deeper dimension. And so when I see that image in black and white, it just makes every scar and callus really pop off. Um, things that, you know, they, they get missed. They don't get seen in this world very often, but when we kind of use light and focus and black and white to say, stop, pause, take in this moment, this is what's happening. Then to me, I see all of these calluses that represent this lifetime cutting trees to build my future. He's cutting things down to build me up. So I keep that to kind of remind me that hands that I used to be really ashamed of, like, oh, dad, can you go wash your hands one more time before we go to the football game or whatever? Um, that like, we, I don't know, we just go through our lives trying to like hide these things we think are muddy, hide these things that we think are not glossy and shiny to the world. And you reach this point in your life where you're like, you know, I'm just really done hiding. And I just want to like make like a banner of this. Yeah. And I think what's really cool for me is you know, when we first started designing the cover for Dirt, in my head, it was going to be an illustration. It was going to be kind of like a fiction-esque illustration of the trailer. Um, and we ended up using the actual photo that my husband, Justin, took the first time I took him home to West Virginia. And that right there is symbolic. Going from, let's do this, like, you know, representation, this, this drawing, this fake version of what it was that's a little more comfortable to, like, no, there it is. And I mean, come on, like to go from this thing that was the shame of my life living in that trailer to being the front cover of my book, that's insane to me. And I think that represents like so much more about what it looks like to really make peace with the mud that made you. Mm. You go on to, I believe, be the first on either side of your family to go on to college, mm. which in and of itself is remarkable. You go on to post-college education you eventually make it into a school that uh, won't even write me back. 
Uh, <laughs> four letters. It's a four letter word and it's called jail. <laughs> I, I find this all just remarkable. How, how does, it's almost an impossible question in some regards to answer, but how does a, a girl who grows up in a single parent house with a man working a couple jobs with dirty hands all the time with mildew smell all, all around with rain that came into <laughs> the metal roof and goes right into the, the carpeted floors. How does that little girl go on to Yale? So you write about it, of course, mm. in the book, there, but in, in your own words, how's the, how do you begin to transform a story where it seems as if you should be living on that the third generation, mm. yeah. right next to grandma and dad and now you, into a girl who has now been accepted into Yale? Yeah. I mean, you know what's so crazy is that if you look at my life trajectory and the way it started out, it started out exactly the same way as my dad's. So... I was growing up on the same plot of land next to, you know, he was inside little Goldie's little red house. I was next to it, but Goldie was a central figure, mother figure for me. Um, we went to the same Sunday school that she forced us to go to. We went to the same little five room elementary school where kindergarten and first grade had to share a room, third and fourth shared a room, fifth and sixth shared a room, second grade got a room to themselves inexplicably. And the gymnasium slash cafeteria slash auditorium, right? So we were on the same path. And I talk about like not a lot of changed on our mountain in a generation. And so in the book, there's this part where I say a lot of people look at the trailer to Yale law upward explosion of like, you know, social mobility or whatever. Um, and they get interested in that part. And for me in draft two of this book, because draft one, if I'd written this, just left it as draft one, or if I'd written this book right after law school, it would have been that look what I did in just a generation. Um, what I got interested in, in writing this version of the book is the spark of change that came the generation before. So for me, when I look back on it and I really did try to say, well, how does this happen? You know, because I don't want it to just be like, I grew up here and then this happened and my life was great. Like how, how like if somebody's reading this and they are a single parent or they are a two parent household, but they're growing up in a trailer or they're growing up without a lot. And they have this kid that they love with their whole hearts and they want to see better for them, but they feel like nothing is in their control. Like what can they control? Um, my dad started bringing home workbooks. I was four years old. I was not in kindergarten yet. He was just afraid that I was going to be like him and be like totally unprepared in the last in the class in kindergarten. So he said, every night you're going to work in these workbooks. I don't really know like enough to like teach you it, but the workbook will teach you. So sit down and work for hours, like a couple hours after dinner. We got encyclopedias, like on the installment plan, you know, like where you can't afford the whole set all at once. So you pay like $30 a month for these gilded books um, at a cost made much higher over time. That's how education goes for poor people sometimes. Um, and I, by the time, so nine months ish go by, by the time I started kindergarten, Mrs. Oliver's class, I was at a fifth grade reading and sorry, fifth grade math and sixth grade reading level. So the kindergarten teachers are like, okay, so she's smart. Maybe we should skip a grade. Maybe we should put her in a gifted program. Oh, she's gifted. You know what I mean? And so these labels started to become a lifeline where when people tell you you're smart, you act smart and you play up to what is expected of you. And then it just, you know, one domino fell into the other, fell into the other. Oh, she's the one who gets straight A's. So I got straight A's, you know, and it all built and built and built to doing well at WVU, to getting scholarships, et cetera. But for me, it all goes back to he brought home workbooks. He did the one thing he could control. He could buy $5 workbooks at the grocery store and make sure that I was just as prepared as I could be for kindergarten. Do you know what I mean? And so I think sometimes we get, we get really overwhelmed in this world and we feel like, you know, I have these kids and I can't control what they were born into. I can't control how much money we have. I can't control the opportunities they will or will not get. Focus on what you can control because I'm telling you, I am living proof that education and just one adult believing something better for you can change everything. And that's so powerful. The, the label of being gifted hmm. or as so many of us hear the label of being nobody yeah, and, not, and washed up and um, yeah. On the path to jail or whatever else it might be, we, we live into the labels that have been given to us, yes. whether it's a parent, a guardian, an educator, for better and for worse. We're yeah. going to live into whatever the expectations are of us. And yeah. like you, I had parents who uh, gave me the right kind of label, and I think that's freed uh, the O'Leary and the, my five siblings to move into the best of their lives. Mm. It's a beautiful story about your father and the label that he helped you grow into. Yeah. 
you still though, you know, you, your, your father is a logger. Yeah. You understand when you cut down a tree that there's little rings within that tree and those rings tell you something about who that tree was and who that tree still is. Hmm. What the tree of your life is still somewhat impoverished, somewhat single parented, somewhat uh, drafty, beat down, single wide. That's your upbringing. That's hmm. your past. And now you're at Yale law. Yeah. <laughs> And those things don't seem to coalesce. They don't seem to collide well together. So talk about being a brilliant, energetic, passionate, forward-looking young lady, but also recognizing who you also are. Yeah. You know, um, gosh, um, well, man, there's so much to unpack there. I think there's so much to be said. When I went to Yale, there's a lot in the book about feeling like, oh, this was, they made a mistake. They're going to, they're going to call me into the office. They're going to see this red pickup truck that my dad's driving to drop me off on the street and go, I'm um, just kidding. <laughs> Get out of here with that. Um, and you know, I, I sat on the, there's this great scene where I'm sitting on the floor in a circle with my small group, the first night of orientation. And they're going, we're going, we're supposed to go around and share something interesting about ourselves. <laughs> And this is like every scene out of like Legally Blonde Elwood's sure. ever made. Um, they're going around and it's like, oh, I worked for the senator. I worked on the Hill. I worked at this, I interned at this law firm. And I'm like panicking because I don't have anything like that to say. And so when it gets to me, I'm like, I, you know, love the mountain years. I bleed blue and gold. My dad's a logger. My grandfather's a coal miner. And I eat tomatoes whole like apples. And it was just like crickets. Like I could hear them blinking. And I was like, well... West Virginia just arrived at Yale Law. I don't know what to tell you. Um, and so I kind of went into that situation expecting to be rejected by them. And so I sort of arm's length held them away from me, sort of like, I'll reject you first. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest, if I could, I would not do law school over, but if I could do that part over, I would, where nobody ever in three years ever said, oh, you don't belong here because of how you grew up. You know, if anything, it was just sort of like nobody really talked about how they grew up and we were just all in it together. So I would do that part over. I would get to know my classmates more and, and give them more of a chance to, you know, actually like get to know them before I just assumed they were going to reject me. But there is this like this moment, right? And I think that's really what you're asking is how do you go from, I grew up in a trailer and across the board, what we see is when people grow up that way, they can put different words on it. We did like a, a big polling on Instagram you can put, use different ways to describe it, but when you grow up that way there or, or anything in your story that makes you feel like that, there becomes this thing in your head where you expect to fail before you try. And you can call it fear of failure. You can call it like a poverty mentality. You can call it like self-deprecation or self-doubt, but, but there has to be this moment where you basically kind of say like, I will own where I came from. I will honor where I came from. It will be a part of me, but it's not the entire story of me. There has to be like a second act. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of call that moment between part one and part two. For me, my faith is important to me. That moment is but God. And so what you see, part one sort of like sets up all of these wounds. It sets up all of these doubts, these fears, these tension points in relationships, these tension points in myself, this doubt and fear of failure. And part two is the like stitching back up of each of those wounds and how those things came to um, be healed over time. And guess what? It was not because I got a bunch of gold stars and I got it. Yale Law didn't kneel it. Getting into the number one law school, I say it's like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory giving you a gold ticket, you know? Like, I've got a golden ticket. I've got a golden ticket. But like, um, I think that was one of the moments when I realized, man, if that can't heal this hole in my heart I'm walking around with, like nothing is going to. And I've got to get back, nothing external, nothing achievement, nothing check mark of success. I've got to get back to doing the work of making peace with where I came from before I can move forward. So it's kind of like this released and reverse idea. We go back and we heal from the beginning and then we move forward. We're talking about the hole in the heart. And um, although not all of us have made it in Yale Law School, and I first among us all have not made it in Yale Law School, <laughs> all of us, including me, we have a hole in our heart and we are longing for it to be fit, filled. And it, generally alcohol won't fill it and success won't fill it and Yale Law won't fill it. Yeah. Uh, why do you think we all have this hole? And what do you think we can begin doing so that we can begin filling that in a way that um, won't look toward the external to take care of us, but ultimately can do it the right way going forward? Mm, yeah, you know, um, I'm always fascinated. So my husband, Justin, is a good example of this, of somebody who um, 
if there is somebody that I know who has come the closest to not having a hole in his heart, it's him. And so I'm always like, like, how did you do this? How is it different for you? And so I think, gosh, I feel like there's this balance there of like some people grow up easier, you know, or better. Like his, he came from a very happy home. His parents are like high school sweethearts who are still like high school sweethearts. Um, there was just no trauma. Like I was like, did you ever have like something bad happen to you in childhood? And he was like, we had a mouse in the kitchen once. And I was like, that does not count. <laughs> no, <laughs> get out of here. Get out of here. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's this tendency for those of us who do have a big hole in our heart to just want to snap our fingers and trade places with people who had easy stories. And man, if I could like just trade place with that person who doesn't really feel like they're walking around with the raw nerve endings exposed all the time, I super would. But then I really started to dig into that. And I was like, you know, a lot of people, my husband excluded from this, but a lot of people who just had easy story, easy story, easy story, they kind of become these like surface people, these like nothing created depth in them, nothing rounded off the plastic hard corners we're all born with. So they're bumping around to people. They're, you know, creating these kind of like cuts on other people unintentionally because there's just no empathy. There's no understanding of why that might be hard or what it might be like to carry pain. And so when I realized that if I switched and didn't have a hole in my heart and didn't have this story, I would also have to give up the empathy, the kindness, the strength, the grit that came with it. I was like, well, that's not it. So now let's, let's figure out how we actually deal with it. For me, for me, giving up that hole was, I think everybody is going to have to like have a certain extent of trying it for themselves. You know, you're going to have to chase achievement for a while before you're really going to believe me when you hear me say no amount of, of achievement is going to fill that hole. You're going to go, yeah, but you don't know how much I can achieve. You don't know how fast I can run. You don't know all the cool things I'm doing. And so I'll go, okay, cool. Go do that for a little while longer. And then when that still doesn't last, when those dopamine hits come faster, but also fall off faster, come back and we'll talk about it. And now we can do the real work of saying, if you are none of these goals, if all of them disappeared tomorrow, if all of these, if the house that we got here on the water in New Haven, Connecticut, if the three golden retrievers, if the like clothes that I'm the first person to wear them all went away, I still have to be a person in the world. And, and who's that person? And so for me, it's a lot about, for me, like I said, my faith, it's about who I am in God, the identity I have in God. If you are not a believer, it's just like who you are separate of what you can do. Who are you if all of that went away? And let's start there. Mm. You said it so quickly that I would imagine many of the listeners may have missed it, but uh, I'm the first one to wear these clothes, which is yes. another way of saying to what I'm hearing you say. I spent a long time, John, wearing secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand hand-me-down clothes. Mm. Well, you don't anymore. You went on to Yale. You had an awesome job opportunity. You, you worked in the space for a while. Yeah. Why did you leave? <laughs> you got the golden ticket, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you turn it in? And uh, why did you... Why'd you surrender the golden ticket? Yeah. So, oh man, John, that is a good question. So um, for your listeners, when I was graduating law school, I had offers at two law firms, one in London and one in New York for six figure salaries, plus a signing bonus, plus benefits, plus it would go up, uh, uh, you know, astronomically the following year. Um, and I had the decision to take that one of those two offers and work a hundred hours a week away from my fiance, almost husband at the time. Justin, or we could determine to go build a business together with our two hands, four hands, actually. And um, what I kind of figured out at the time was we think that when someone sacrifices the way that my dad did for me, for example, um, so that I could one day have more, when he goes out and works from 5 a.m. in the darkness to well after dark, covered in mud, soaking wet, freezing cold, both ankles at one point in a cast, still going to work. I, you start to believe that the honoring of that kind of sacrifice is success. And what I started to realize around that time, and have continued, it's made so much more sense in the last year, especially, but the last 10 years, we'll say it's been a journey, is that the true honoring of someone's sacrifice for your life so you can have something different, it's not that you go get success. It's that you go do something significant. And for me, significance is when it stops being about you. And when it stops you know, being about the, oh gosh, I'm going to live in the Upper East Side in New York. My kids are going to go to the right private school. I'm not picking on those things if they if they matter to you. But I would have been making that choice because it was the guaranteed ticket to success for Mary. I would have lived a very comfortable life. 
but I would have been settling for safe. And I think safety is a big, like there's a lot of S's there. There's uh, sacrifice, success, significance, settling, and safe. And so for me to truly honor his sacrifice was not to go get success for myself and settle for that, settle for like the nice fat cat comfy lifestyle. It was for me to say, I do not want to live a life that's quiet and safe and subdued and numb. I want to go live a life that's on fire and it's loud and it's beautiful and it's joy filled and it's building things we believe in. And they're, we're building things that make other people's lives easier, better, um, that we're telling their story and that we're actually leaving something behind beyond just what served us serve is another S. So I feel like we were guided by the S's. I left the law firm offers. I left that golden ticket life because I would rather be serving and significant than settling for what the world says success looks like. Is that an either or? Oh. Is it, John, you either choose success or you choose significance, but you don't choose both at the same time. Oh, man, you are very, very good at this, John O'Leary. I'm highly caffeinated right now, so I'm just going to keep <laughs> it up as long as you allow me to. I love, I love that um, because, I, like, I, I, so I was a philosophy major, uh, political science first, and then philosophy major in undergrad, and then I got my master's in philosophy before law school. And so I live for conversations like this. I do not think it has to be an either or, but I do think it's a first second. Mm -hmm. I think when we go into it and we say, I'm not going to go after this because I'll make money or I'll you know, look really good to the world or I'll have the right house or the right clothes. I'm going to go into this because it's a gift I've been given. It's a thing that sets me on fire that I will regret, you know, on my deathbed if I don't go do and it serves other people. I think the success follows. And when you get that order right, then it's like the success just flows to you. When you get that order wrong, you spend your whole life chasing it. I saw this fantastic cartoon. It was actually talking about like money. It was in like a magazine about money. I don't remember. And it was like, you can either chase the cat and anybody who's ever tried to like chase a cat to pet the cat and it keeps running away, or you can have what the cat wants and the cat comes to you. And for me, that kind of means like you can either spend your whole life chasing worth in this external success, or you can just be this person of peace who knows who you are and what you stand for and success is drawn to you. Mm. When people get to the final page of the book, Dirt, yeah. the story of your life, the story of you of your father's life and the stories of, of your mother and, and Goldie and everyone else who is part of your journey. Mm. What do you hope they learn and know about their own life? I think, um, you know, when I was writing this book, I think most books, I don't know, maybe this is common of all books, but I feel like most books probably have one main arc and then maybe like one secondary arc. I feel like this book had like seven arcs <laughs> that had to resolve. I literally had a notepad where I was like tracking them. Like what, what are all of these arcs? There's this relationship with me and Goldie there's this incredibly powerful scene, at least I think it's powerful, um, where it's post law school and we're building our business and we are in that like chase success kind of, even though we'd said, we're not going to do this because it's what is expected. There's, there's always that draw to chase success. Uh -huh. We were busy chasing success while my grandma Goldie was declining and getting sicker. And I was not there when she passed and in your video, oh man, John, dang it. Um, <laughs> I got this far. Um, in your video, when you talk about, um, you know, not being there for Jack and like what that, how you carry that, like me and Goldie, I carry that as well. I think that's it. I think when people get to the end of this book, my hope is that, you know, kind of like what we talked about in the beginning, like there's still time, you're still here. Maybe you look at your life in the last five, 10, 20 years have been spent missing it because you're chasing success. But my hope is that when you get to the end of this book, you go, man, like, I get it. I can chase and I can chase and I can chase. It's never going to be enough. Let me start living while I'm here, you know? Let me not miss the people that matter while they're still here. So I'm going to take a deep breath and give one more take of that so you have something to work with. <sighs> um, yeah, I just feel like when people get to the end of this book, I hope that they know that there is, you can spend your whole life going out, trying to run from the dirt, trying to run from the mud in your story, trying to walk into the room and be the most, I always, when I was writing this book said it was, I was writing this for the most put together person in the room, the person you would walk in and you would never guess what they've gone through in their story. And they have spent their whole life running so hard from failure that they stumbled into success, but they feel like every time they walk into a room, people can see right through them. I hope that when people get to the end of that page, they go, 
you know, I think I'm finally ready to just show up as I am. Mary, it's a beautiful book. It's a great story. The characters are phenomenal, but the main character, like it or not, is you. And it's, it's just a beautiful <laughs> story of the reckoning of celebrating what you used to run from and realizing the miracle beneath the dirt. Mm-hmm. And it is one. And so it's a, it's just, it's, it was a terrific read. It was great getting to know you on the podcast. Sadly for you, you're not quite through this thing yet. We have a, a what we call the Live Inspired Seven. They are seven oh. questions we ask every one of our guests. And the very first question, it's a layup, in particular for someone who graduated Yale Law. <laughs> you have at least one answer for this. Mary, what is the best book? Mm. Only one. What is the best book you've ever read? Oh, my gosh. The best book I've ever read. I think I'm going to say The Glass Castle. I saw a lot of my story and her story, and she was... Um, one of the first people to really inspire me that you can tell your story and even when it involves other hard people without throwing them under the bus and without having an attitude or an opinion, you can just tell it as it was and you can pursue grace and reconciliation instead of, um, you know, just, just blowing people's lives up basically. And, um, that that quieter version of, of grace and reconciliation is heard over the loud tell-alls, I guess. Mm. What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little mountaineer growing up in West Virginia that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Oh, dang, John. Woo. Um, you know, I turned 40 in May and I think there's something that happens when you turn 40 and it's like you return to that little version of you and probably writing this book helped with that. And so I am wearing you see me right now, I'm wearing a jean jacket, <laughs> jean jacket and a little like pastel rainbow dress situation. And I feel like I have found her again. So I would say like a year ago, maybe to answer the question, I think just that ability to be like free and happy, you know, like I got so serious trying to get success and get out of there that I forgot what it was like to just like run through the woods, you know? So I think, I think I've found her again, but that would be my answer. Yeah. I'm glad. Mary, if your trailer was on fire or your home today is on fire and your husband, Justin, and the three dogs are out, you okay. have okay. an opportunity to run in and grab one item that really does matter to you. Hmm. What's that one thing that you run in and grab? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be we. It's not. It's gonna be a little bit less of like a, a sexy answer because we're photographers, so it's going to be the like hard drive raid system that has all of our photos, um, that they're also probably backed up in the cloud. So I'll give a better answer than that. But you know, the photos the uh, my grandma was the historian of our family and she did all the photo albums, which I inherited. Um, you know, I think beyond that, beyond any of the, like, do we have the photos? Do we have the, the technology and all that stuff backed up? You know, what I think is kind of powerful is like, as long as my husband and the dogs are out and, and we have the memories backed up somewhere, I think I'm good. You know? <laughs> Let it burn, man. <laughs> I mean, hopefully not. Hopefully, hopefully not. You know, but um, I think I think what I think that's actually a very big statement for me, um, because a lot of my life was defined by like getting to this place, of mm. having the stuff and having the house, and so, um, yeah, I, th- I don't know. I think. I'd probably find something to grab. I think we all would, but I think as long as like the people I love and what matters are there and, and we know where, we know where the stories are. We know where the history is. I think we're good. Mary, if, if you could sit on a bench overlooking a gorgeous, whether you want to be on a mountaintop or beachside okay. on a perfect day and have a long conversation with anybody mm-hmm. living or dead, who would you like to be seated right next to? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, my grandma Goldie is the first one that comes to mind. I think it'd be really cool to hear her stories again. What's the first question you would ask grandma? Mm. I mean, I think I'd ask her about heaven, you know, what's it like? <laughs> um, she was one of the first people to kind of teach me about God and um, in her own very Goldie way, like this very like, we're going to do this. So God's not looking down and, you know, is drawing down his eyes at you. Um, but yeah, and she was always a woman of faith and, and, um, was the first one to introduce me to faith. So I just want to know, like, what's heaven like? What's the best advice you've ever received? Um, I think it's something like treat people like people, which was, I I worked this job when I was like 18 in between my freshman and sophomore years, I guess it was maybe 19 and 20. And I had this boss that summer and he was just like this font of wisdom. And every other day I'd go into his office and he was like dropping some other truth bomb on me. 
<laughs> um, but the one that stuck out was treat people like people. And what that meant was it's kind of like a different version of like, if you can make celebrities feel like regular people and regular people feel like celebrities, then you're, you're on to something. And it's like finding that common ground. We're all humans. We all have, like you said, like some, most of us have holes in our hearts. We all want, we have dreams we want to see come true. So just like finding that there's so much more we have in common than what separates us. Gosh, I think during these days, among all days, we need to be reminded of the, yeah. uh, of the community principle. What advice would you give your 20 year old self? Oh, yes, I've got this one. I know this one. Okay. Um, assume it works out. Assume it works out. Assume that if you push hard enough, uh, push hard enough, it's not the right way. Cause we don't want to push. We don't want to keep pushing, but assume that if you do the work, if you give it time, if you keep focused in the same direction, just like for a second, assume it works out. I've been thinking about this a lot with this book. I'm going to be honest with you. Assume the book works out. Assume that it does the things I hope it to do. Just, just, just take that as a given that it, with enough time, enough people will read it, enough t- people will be helped by it. What that does when you can assume that it works out, it either you either get what you want or you get something better or you're protected from what you thought you wanted, right? Assume it works out. Then it allows you to actually enjoy the journey. It actually allows you to enjoy the process. It allows you to enjoy these conversations, you know, and be in it and not get to the end of your life and go, okay, cool. I did get everything I wanted, but then I missed all of it in the process. You know, I missed all of it while I was waiting for the next thing to happen. I hear you loud and clear. And the final question for Mary Morantz. Mary, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. Oh, man. How would you like your one sentence to read? Um, I, you know, I this is the tagline for my show, my podcast, but and it's become kind of like a an you know a caricature of itself in that respect. Is slow growth equals strong roots? But in a lot of ways, a lot of ways, it has defined my life. I have never been the overnight success, which people are going to be like, "What are you talking about? You got into Yale Law? It's not going to feel that way." But to me, I have always been the one that people. I was too you know, quiet or too introverted or too deep. I'm over here thinking deep thoughts. I'm not like the fun, loud one in the room. So I've always been the one people counted out or underestimated. Um, Mm. But like a river cutting through rock, like I'm just like, I got that tenacity. I got that grit. I keep coming back. I keep kind of wearing you down. And um, yeah, like when it grows slow and steady over the long haul, we all think we want to like be that overnight success, that Instagram influencer who suddenly has a million followers overnight but like I always compare that to like growing like a weed where it like shoots up overnight really fast and it's like, whoa, that's like six feet tall. But you pull it up and it's got like an inch of roots. Like mm-hmm. I want to grow for a hundred years and be one of those like giants my dad talks about that hopefully does not get cut down. Um, where, you know, you walk among the giants by growing over the hundred years, right? You grow and you, you do that because you provide shade and shelter for others and you provide, you know, all the little trees that come after you, right? It's not just like, this one tree, one tree can turn into a hundred thousand trees. So slow growth equals strong roots. Mary, this has been a pleasure. I want to thank you for writing the book, Dirt. I want to thank you for living this story within it. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Live Inspired Podcast. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. It just means the world. And I, uh, you have a new fan for life in me. Also, anybody who can make me cry this much on an episode, we are going to be really good friends. Well, it's going to be a good day. And uh, my friends, that is Mary Moran. She's the author of the book, Dirt. My name is John O'Leary, and this remains your day. Choose to live inspired. And now, a word from our friends at Keeley Companies. At Keeley Companies, they do things a bit differently. They proudly call themselves Keelians. They pride themselves on swag that will knock your socks off. They have a dedicated vice president of learning and education, They have their own philanthropic foundation called Keeley Cares. They empower every Keelian to speak up if they feel unsafe. They have the most competitive wellness challenges around. They are committed to being better leaders of diversity and inclusion. They aren't afraid to dream big. And in the words of my friend, Rusty Keeley, they're just getting started. Check out more information on them by going to KeeleyCompanies.com.